question number 19. Love's a fragile little flame, it could burn all, it could burn all. A book you thought you loved but quickly came to hate. Um, stop me if you've heard this before. Enclave by Anna Guaira, because except for some really shoddy world building at the beginning, I really liked the first half until they get to the surface, because they live underground, until they get to the surface and then you find out what a complete and total evil bitch Deuce is. Yeah, and then I was like, nope, hate this book, shit. Question number 20. Something happens when everybody finds I see the vultures or the wings drop by. A book you didn't want to be seen reading. Um, there is no book that I have read that I would not be willing to be seen reading, I'm pretty sure. Um, because at the time that I read it. Now, granted, there are books that I wouldn't read now that I read when I was younger, but when I read them, I was not embarrassed to be reading them. Um, I don't read things that I can't fess up to, I'm pretty sure. I'm sure, like, if I thought about it, I could maybe think of one, but I'd have to think about it for, like, a while. Question 21. It drives us the very worst. Oh, oh. When the flowers that we grown together die of thirst. When the wait between books made you forget everything that happened in the other books. Um, The Others by Ann Bishop. When I opened Etched in Bone, when it came in the mail, I, they, the first or second scene, they mention this character, and then this other character, and then another character, and I'm like, who are you people? I have no idea who you are. I don't know who these people are. I don't know what's going on. And, um, I, like, I managed to muddle through the fifth book, because, like, later in the book, they explain a lot of stuff, but I'm like, I feel like these explanations could have been, you know, a lot easier, would have made things easier if they were in the first ten pages. And so now I'm actually rereading the series so that then I can read the fifth book and maybe have like an easier grasp of what's going on. Question 22. A book or series you wiped from your memory. Things fall apart. I don't even remember who wrote it, but I had to read it my senior year of high school. Maybe it was my junior year. I forget. But basically, this book is about, like, a time of a time in history in Africa with, like, Western, or I guess it would be Northern, actually, for them, colonization, like, by the British and the Dutch and the Portuguese and blah, blah, whatever. And, like, basically, it's, like, when, you know, non-African people were, like, encroaching on Africa and, like, taking slaves and trying to eradicate the culture and being complete asshats. And basically, the book is rocks fall and everybody dies except for, like, a few people who don't die but their lives suck. And we had to read it for school. I actually got away with only reading, like, the first 50 pages because my AP Lit teacher made the mistake of using the Socratic method in class. And so it's really easy, if you know how, to fake like you've read stuff when you haven't read stuff if the way to prove that you read stuff is by discussing it using the Socratic method. So my copy of the 1989 album, I guess, is the deluxe album. So I have a few other songs on here that were not in the original tag. So, question number 23. A bad case of insta-love. I'm going to say Aragon and Arya from The Inheritance Cycle by Christopher Paolini. Because they fall in love, like, in the first book. And I'm like, you don't even know her! Also, she's, like, 10 billion years old, and you're, like, 14. Okay, actually, I think he's, like, 15. But, you know what, whatever. Aragon is, like... Like, I could tell from the beginning. I'm like, one, this relationship is a total ripoff of Tolkien. Two... Um, this is not going to go anywhere that you want it to go. And three, you are totally thinking with your loins and not with your heart or your brain. Question number 24. Your favorite contemporary romance or couple. I'm going to go with, in the Sisterhood of the Traveling Pants series, by Ann Brashears, Brian McBrian, and Timmy, Tibby Rollins Tomko. Brian McBrian is probably one of the cutest, most amazing boys in a contemporary novel that I've ever read. I really love Brian McBrian, and I love Tibby. She's, I, I would be totally be friends with her. She probably wouldn't be friends with me if I, you know, when I was her age, but maybe she would. I don't know. But I really love Tibby, and I really love her relationship with Brian. I think it's really realistic. I think Brian's really great. I think that Tibby, although not as great as she could be, is realistic and is not bad. I don't think she's trying to be bad when she makes mistakes. She just makes mistakes. She's a teenage girl. It happens. And then also, I love the fact that when her and Brian have a baby, they name it Bailey, because Bailey is a friend of Tibby's that she made in the first book who passed away. And I think just, I really like how Tibby is. 
and I like the way she grows, and I really like Brian and the fact that he's okay with that. He's okay with the fact that she changes. And when he makes mistakes, although he's not okay with the mistakes, he is willing to give her, you know, chances to fix those mistakes. I really like Brian. He's, like, the best boyfriend ever. Quest oh, and then Eric from the Sister of the Traveling Pants series. Also, Eric, who ends up with Bridget. But I felt Brian was a better choice because he's in all five books, and Eric is only in three of the books. Question number 25. You keep his shirt, he keeps his word, and for once, you let go of your fears and your ghosts. A hero or heroine with some sort of trauma who has a supportive significant other who helps them heal, but without the magic penis trope, which is like, you know, the girl has like serious sexual trauma, and the boy is like, here, we will have sex, and then all your problems will be solved. Like, you know, oh, I was like, you know, raped repeatedly as a child and I can't handle intimacy oh wait we're gonna have sex oh I have nothing to fear ever again ever I'm healed I'm fixed that is the magic penis trope and it's stupid and I'm gonna go with Feyre Archeron from A Court of Mist and Fury because um in A Court of Thorns and Roses she's not like super jacked up in the brain really um she has a lot of like habits to overcome and a lot of like ingrained prejudice but she's not really dealing with PTSD the way she does in A Court of Mist and Fury and um, Rysand and his guys. It's not just Rysand, actually. It's all of them. Um, all of them are so supportive, and I really like that. I mean, everyone in the Night Court, by the way, not like everyone in the book, just just to clarify. But then also um, Charlotte Holmes from um, A Study in Charlotte and The Last of August. I have not read The Last of August yet, and I need to, but I'm waiting for the audiobook. But um, you find out in A Study in Charlotte that Charlotte was raped um, prior to the events of the book, and also, she's kind of abused at home because of the way her parents... Her parents aren't doing it on purpose, but they do it. Um, and just because you don't do it on purpose doesn't mean it's not abuse. And Jamie, Jamie Watson, is very supportive and okay with the boundaries she sets. And he tries to be there for her and help her so that, you know... Because apparently it's like a genetic thing. The Holmeses can be very self-destructive, especially when bad things happen to them. And so he's, he has, like, the knowledge of previous Watsons to help him take care of her, but he is taking care of her. And he does help her, and he's not a dick about it most of the time. I mean, you know, boys... I'm gonna say boys will be boys, and what I mean is people will be people. People make mistakes. But he's not like, well, you know, all the mistakes that I ever make are Charlotte's fault, you know, fuck her. He's actually really... He's great. I really like him. And I actually... He has an anger management issue, but he never takes out his anger on Charlotte, and I really like that. Question number 26. A character everyone underestimates. I'm going to go with Radu in And I Darken by Kirsten White. He is the brother of the main character. And I Darken is a, a historical AU where Vlad the Impaler, Vlad Tepes III, was born a woman instead of a man. And so instead of Vlad, his name is her name is Lada. And, but everything else is the same, like all the major events. When Vlad Tepes was sent to um, the Ottoman Empire as a hostage against his father, that happens to Lada and her brother Radu. And at one point, they get in some serious trouble, and you realize that the Sultan has actually forgotten that they're there. But because their father fucked up, if he remembers that they're there, he's probably going to kill them. And then he remembers that they're there because of something that Lada did. And um, she thinks that they're about to die. And all of a sudden, Radu's like, oh, you know, I have a plan. But he doesn't say, I have a plan. But, like, in his brain, he's like, ding, light bulb. And so he starts talking. And the Sultan is like, huh. And Lada's like, the fuck you doing? And he's just like, trust me, I got this. And the thing is, he's actually, uh, up until this point, he'd actually kind of shown himself to be very politically unsavvy and very likely to get them all killed. And so the fact that he actually, like, in the heat of the moment, um, managed to come up with this plan is actually pretty amazing and then he from then on regardless of how people expect him to act they still think that he's like this quiet shy retiring young man who um you know doesn't actually know what he's doing and he actually becomes a very strong political powerhouse he's basically a spy he's basically a spy for um muhammad the the prince the heir to the throne and, uh, and I think that's really cool. And what I also think is cool is that he's, um, totally in love with Muhammad. And I'm pretty sure Muhammad is, is in love with him. I think Muhammad's in love with both of them, Lada and Radu. And then each one of them is in love with him, and it's, but it's like this whole complicated thing. And, yeah, but that's like a talk for a different day. Question number 27. <laughs> A 
character who comes out on top of her trials like a badass mouse. And I borrowed that word from Superwoman because Lily's amazing. Um, I'm going to say Phaedra No Delaney from the Kushiel's Dart trilogy. Now, there's actually like nine books in the Kushiel trilogy, but each but the books are broken up into three trilogies, and she's from the first trilogy. Um, Phaedra No Delaney is a girl who was born to a prostitute and a merchant, but in a country where prostitution is considered a sacred art. Um, so it's not like, you know, oh my god, she's the daughter of a hooker. Um, it's actually, like, it's not that big of a deal. Except that, um, her parents couldn't afford to take care of her because the merchanting thing wasn't really working out and the dad didn't want his wife, um, hooking with other people since they were married now. So they actually gave her as an indentured child to another brothel. But she was considered, um, damaged goods because she has this scarlet pinprick in her iris, like, her eyes are brown, but then she's got this one scarlet fleck in her left eye. And you actually find out that that means that she's chosen by, um, Kushiel, who's the, uh, we're gonna, it's, he's actually the, an angel, but we're gonna say patron saint just because it's easier, that I, and means I don't have to go into, like, into detail about the world building for something that is not a review. But he's the patron saint, basically, of, um, sadomasochists. And so she ends up being trained as a courtesan by the by the former king's the king died but the former king's spy master who trains her as a spy specifically so that she can later when they grow up she can protect the girl who's the crown princess who then will be queen and that actually ends up what that what that's what happens all these terrible things happen including Phaedra her the guy who trained her who's basically like her father he's murdered her one of her two best friends is murdered at the same time and then um, the person who set it all up, she goes to that person not knowing that they set it up. And she's like, I need your help because this is what happened. She's in love with this person. And then that person betrays her. And the person knows that Phaedra's in love with her. And, and so it's actually kind of interesting because Phaedra's bisexual, which is nice. You know, it's a bisexual protagonist. She's super cool. I really like the book, actually. There's some things in the world building that I really don't like. But the main plot I really like. But it's... um. But she has all these terrible things happen. She's sold into slavery at one point to Vikings, and or like the fantasy equivalent of Vikings. And she's separated from everything that she knows and loves. She ends up um, being tortured at, um, at one point, to the point that even like her special chosenness by the patron saint of masochists doesn't save her at all. Um, and so it's, you know, all these terrible things happen. And when she comes out at the end of the book, she has saved the kingdom saved the queen, stopped the bad guy, found a boyfriend, um, avenged the death of her, of her father figure and best friend, um, and won, like, a whole bunch of awards, and become, and been, uh, elevated to peerage. So, like I said, like a bouse. Anyway, so that is the Taylor Swift 1989 tag, which is almost 50 freaking minutes long, but once I edit it, it will probably be shorter, I'm hoping, because that's really long. And my voice is starting to go, so I will talk to you guys later. Please like, comment, and subscribe, let me know what you thought. Please don't kill me about the Harry Potter or Throne of Glass or Twilight comments. And, you know, just let me know. I like hearing from people, and I will talk to you guys later. Bye!